Growing questions tonight about whether our medical system is equipped to handle this outbreak. There are a million hospital beds in this country, but only 45,000 in intensive care units. Testing tents are being set up, this one outside a hospital near Boston, aiming to test patients without exposing them to the rest of the medical facility. Dr. Jeremy Faust of Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston writing in the Washington Post today, he says we need to have enough tests for every single American and we need to establish thousands of pop-up facilities, outdoor assembly lines and tents to administer tests immediately. In the Wall Street Journal, Dr. Scott Gottlieb teaming with economist Michael Strain asking Congress for help limiting the economic impact of this outbreak. They write, perhaps ominously, the country is, quote, better off spending the money to prevent deaths than spending the money to deal with the aftermath of a lethal epidemic. Doctors Faust and Gottlieb with us tonight. Dr. Gottlieb uh, is back with us. Uh, and I'll begin with you, Dr. Gottlieb. But the, the congressional doctor today said that 70 to 150 million people in this country could be infected. Is that true? Well, he's looking out over a long period of time. Um, the question is how many people are going to be infected through the course of this epidemic. There might be continued spread even after we get through this initial phase. I think if we take the kinds of mitigation steps we should to slow the spread of this virus and try to keep the threshold of the peak number of cases below the point at which the health care system gets exhausted, we can, we can contain this. I want to look more like South Korea than Italy right now. Italy has 12,000 cases, 800 deaths. South Korea has about 8,000 cases, 60 deaths, because they were able to put in place mitigation steps to keep their health care system from getting exhausted. When we, and, and after that point, that's when you see the fatalities start to rise. Dr. Faust, so I turn to you on those very same numbers as you write this evening about the stress that could put on the hospital system, to say the least. Yeah, that's right. I mean, the, the most important thing we can do right now is to shine a light on this problem and to know where the problem is. Uncertainty is definitely the enemy. What we need to do is to do massive testing because what that does is that tells us where the problem is and it, it really identifies maybe the, the asymptomatic, the symptom-free patients among us who we didn't even know they had it and says, you need to isolate. You need to actually not put the at-risk vulnerable people in, in your crosshairs and avoiding them. I think we just need to keep breathing. I mean that literally and figuratively. Figuratively in the sense that we're going to get through this. It's going to be difficult. It's going to be challenging times ahead. And I mean it literally also. We need to focus all of our resources, not on the young and healthy, but on protecting the, the elderly, people in nursing homes. That's where the hot spots are. I'm concerned that over social distancing, uh, doing it without thinking about it, could be a problem. You write that we need tests for everybody. Is that realistic if, if the numbers end up being as large as I just mentioned with Dr. Gottlieb? In South Korea, they've done hundreds of thousands of tests in a short period of time. I think the American system has the ability, if it wants to, to, to roll out a lot of testing. It cannot be done in ERs like where I work on the front line. It has to be adjacent or in other pop-up facilities. The government is showing signs of interest in this, and that's really good. Because if we can scale it up to the, North, to the South Korean levels, excuse me, the South Korean levels, and even go beyond that, we will actually do something that no one else has done. I think the reason that they've saved so many lives is not just what Dr. Gottlieb says in terms of social isolation, but it's in terms of knowing where the problem is so we can focus the resources. It actually saves lives if you didn't know you had it and therefore you don't go to see your grandmother who is elderly. That's a big, huge deal. Yeah, no, it's a great point. I agree with the doctor. I mean, South Korea, what they were able to do is turn over a lot of their cases and even, even diagnose asymptomatic, mildly symptomatic cases and try to self-isolate those people at home. Um, we're getting in place the capacity right now. We're up to, by my calculation, the ability to test 16,000 people a day. Um, it's still not enough, and we're not at the numbers that South Korea was achieving. We need to bring that up more. You think we need to have widespread they... shutdowns? I think that we need well, to rethink, in, especially in areas where there are outbreaks, bringing people together indoors where we know you can have rapid transmission. So closing things like malls and theaters in places like Seattle, canceling large events in places where we know there's active community transmission, I think that makes eminent sense. And not, though, in any city. It has to be one where there's a, a larger number of cases. New York City, for example, should not close its well, school system. Well, New York system. City might be a hot spot. I mean, to the doctor's point, we really don't know where the outbreaks are right now because we don't have the, the broad diagnostic testing in place. So there might be outbreaks in cities that we're just not aware of right now. They, they might not be very large at this point, but there certainly are outbreaks in cities that we're not aware of. Dr. Faust, you wanted to add something? I think, 
Yeah, I think what we have to do, and I think we agree on this, is to seriously think about canceling a lot of mass gatherings. The yeah. problem is no one is seriously thinking about it. They're just doing it. And the, the reason that's a problem is the arguments in favor of social distancing, canceling school, for example, are very valid in many cases. They're really good. And so there's no doubt that in many cases this could save lives. But what no one's doing is the second order analysis, like we do in foreign policy. Say we shouldn't do that because it leads downstream problems. Well, maybe canceling school in some neighborhoods could actually cause a problem. Why? Because the parents of the kids either have to stay home from work or they can't stay home from work and their grandparents have to take care of them. There have been situations in past quarantines and lockdowns when it backfired. So I'm not saying let's not think about it. I'm saying let's think about it. But I'm actually worried that we're not thinking about it. And we're that's just the role. doing it without any real analysis. Yeah, I mean, it's an excellent point. And that's the role where Congress can step in and provide assistance, especially to vulnerable individuals with you know, increased spending on, on nutrition for children who can't go to school, even direct payments to lower income workers who might be out of work or without a paycheck. We should think about those measures right now to offset the cost of the kinds of steps we need to take to prevent spread. Lastly, and most importantly to some, how long was this going to last? You know, I think that we're in a period right now where this is going to be a difficult two months. I think March is going to be a difficult month. Hopefully in April we're coming down the epidemic curve if we take the right steps here. But this is probably a two-month ordeal before we start to see the declines that South Korea now seems to be seeing in their epidemic.